What's up, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, Boogie298 coming at you live once again through the power of the internet, and it's time for my weekly gaming news show, so let's get right into the games. First topic I want to talk about this week, I want to talk about No Man's Sky next, because everybody loves a redemption story, and this is probably one of the best redemption stories in gaming. Now, in case you're not caught up with the history of No Man's Sky, it's a game that's been out for a couple of years. It was heavily hyped by the folks over there at PlayStation. It had a trailer that made the game look absolutely amazing at Jeff Keighley's The Game Awards. And when the game finally came out, it was basically in early access. Uh, a lot of the features that have been promised simply were not there, and there was absolutely no sign that they were going to be there. The game was definitely not the game it was hyped up to be upon release. The game promised all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, procedurally generated planets with lots of different diversity and life on it, a deep craft crafting system, a deep space exploration system, multiplayer, uh, all kinds of great stuff that just simply wasn't there. And this was made um, so much worse because the creator of the game, just before the game's launch, promised all this really crazy stuff. They promised all this stuff that just simply wasn't in the game. And I guess they could have easily just pocketed the money and left, but for the last two years, they have been working on this game, now resulting in what they're calling version 1.5, I guess, the No Man's Sky Next patch. It is basically a mega patch, which adds a lot of new stuff to the game, a lot of depth to the game, and one of the biggest promises Sean Murray made, which is multiplayer. Now here's the thing, it's still No Man's Sky, if the initial launch didn't please you at least a little bit, as it did me, uh, then you're probably not going to like No Man's Sky next. It's still Minecraft in space with space exploration, naming animals, naming plants, naming rocks, now with base building, now with vehicles, now with cooler planets to look at, and more diverse biomes, but it's still pretty much the same game, only with a lot more depth and a lot more content. Here's the thing though, if you already bought it and you held on to that copy without refunding it, Now's a good time to reinstall it, and since it's on sale for about half off right now at about 30 bucks everywhere, including, I think, on Xbox now, then it might be something you want to dabble with. I would definitely watch somebody play it first to make sure it's the kind of game you're interested in, but I think if you're interested in this, I can highly recommend this version of the game. But this does create a bit of an ethical quandary. Should we reward them for doing this, or should we not? I love a redemption story, and I love the fact that instead of pocketing the money and running, they decided to create the game they always wanted to create with the money that they took in. I, I think that's fantastic. It's certainly not the first time that's happened, but it's certainly the most visible example of it ever happening. There have been plenty of games that came out to critical uh, failure that have been worked on and fixed, um, but this is certainly the most visible one yet, and I'm very, very proud of the job that Sean Murray and his team did. I'm so glad that they stuck to it, even dealing with the death threats and all the crazy stuff they had to deal with. They still made the game they promised, and this is really close to the game they promised. But I want to pass the question off to you. Do you think we should be rewarding Hello Games and Sean Murray for this kind of behavior? Do you think we should buy the game now that they've completed it, reward them for sticking it out? Um, do you think we should still be mad about the hype train and, and the derailment and all of the stuff that happened before? Let me know in the comments section below. In my personal opinion, I think this is great. They, they completed the game, they made it as good as they could, and I'm glad to throw money at them, but I'm only one consumer. I'm curious as to what you think because you guys make up the bulk of my audience and, and obviously uh, your, your dollars count way more than mine. Now this week's episode is sponsored by the folks over at Glasses USA and you can find the link in the description box below. They make literally every pair of glasses you've seen me wear on this channel in the last couple of years, including these awesome prescription sunglasses I'm taking to RTX with me this week. And the reason I go with Glasses USA is because when I go to the eye doctor and get my prescription, they always try to upsell you on the glasses and make as much profit as they can. But Glasses USA, they have glasses as inexpensive as $48 for the frames and the lenses together. All you got to do is click on the link in the description box below and you can start shopping for thousands of different styles. Uh, and you can upload a picture of your face and then virtually try on each pair of glasses to see what you're going to look like in them. They have 24 hour a day customer support. They have a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you try a pair of glasses and you don't like them for any reason, you can get a full refund. The best part about it is if you click on the link in the description box below and start shopping for glasses right now, they're going to offer you an even deeper discount on their already discounted prices. You'll be wearing the exact same kind of glasses I wear in every single episode. And then on top of that, you'll be supporting me at the same time while you save a buttload of money. So check them out. Now here's a quick little story about a game I bet you didn't even know existed. There was a game called The Culling, which was one of the very first battle royales to market. It was fairly unique because it had a lot of cool melee weapons, and the way it played was fairly different from the rest. But they continued to work on that game as it was released in early access, and they made it fairly unrecognizable from the initial version, scaring off a large portion of the player base. And in order to try to get that player base back, they launched a sequel to the game called The Culling 2. 
And this launch went so badly that you literally could not get enough people into a Battle Royale game, with only 50 people in it, by the way, to actually play the game. You could win a Battle Royale game just by queuing up and no one else joining, and you would automatically win because you would be the only person in it. You wouldn't even load the map. You would just get the victory. After a few days of this, they decided to pull this game off of market and refund everybody that purchased it. <laughs> wow. Now, there's a lot of different reasons that this happened, and I could go into it for a while, but I'm just going to say it boiled down to two major things. A lot of bad decisions from the folks over there developing these games, uh, but more importantly, the saturation of the Battle Royale market. You've got Fortnite, you've got PUBG, you've got H1Z1, you've got all these other different games, Realm Royale, some of the smaller games. There's so many Battle Royales out right now, and there's so many yet to come. If you are currently developing a Battle Royale, don't. Just stop. Activision, EA, I don't know why you guys are wasting your money on something like this, but just know there's only so many players interested in Battle Royale, and they're already playing a game. They've picked a game. They've sunk money into that game. I know you want that kind of money, but just know you should probably find a different life service to back. Use the Calling 2 as a warning sign. This is the albatross around your neck. Pay attention. And if you're developing a Battle Royale game, stop. And if you don't mind me like waxing poetic and theory crafting here just a little bit, let me just go ahead and say the problem with these types of games is fairly simple. When it comes to Fortnite, when it comes to League of Legends, when it comes to Overwatch, there's only so many esports players in the world. There's only so many players who are going to spend their every waking moment grinding away at your competitive game. Uh, now, that's a good number of people, and yes, when a game is very, very popular, like League of Legends was, like World of Warcraft was, like um, uh, Fortnite now is, you will add new players that normally would not be doing that, but it's a small number of players. When it comes to games as a service, you pretty much can only play one, maybe two games consistently at a time, and I guarantee if you're watching this right now and you do play one of these games competitively, you used to be a huge fan of an older franchise you've now abandoned for a newer game that you're currently obsessed with. You are a finite resource. I am a finite resource. If you're developing games right now, I wouldn't try to tap into that market as profitable as it seems. Do something that the market's not doing. Smaller games, single-player games, one-and-done games, games that people like me will still consume because we're not spending all our time playing Fortnite or League of Legends or something repetitive like that. You saw it with the MMORPG market. It definitely happened there. A lot of people tried to get in on that, and they all fell. They all lost their asses. Same with Battle Royales or whatever the next flavor of the day is. Do something different. Be the next new thing. Be the next new thing that everybody hops on. That's how you get rich. While we're at it, while we're talking about Fortnite, by the way, why does everybody hate that game right now? I mean, a lot of people love it. I do feel pretty indifferent about it. I've dabbled with it. But every time I mention it in the title or a thumbnail, you guys go ballistic in the comments section. If you are one of those people, can you tell me why you hate that game so much in the comments section? Because I'd really, really like to know. I don't hate it. I don't hate much of anything. Well, Battlefront 2. But other than that. And it's that time of week where we crap all over Nintendo because Nintendo has decided to arm themselves with a group of lawyers to crush the hopes and dreams of fans and people who love retro gaming. So let's get into that, I guess. So before you can understand the story, let me explain to you the basic concept of a ROM. A ROM is a digital file that contains the original source files of a game, let's say like Super Mario Brothers. Um, and then you can basically download that and use an emulator to play those games. Now, that's technically illegal to do unless you have a physical copy of the original game in your possession. You own that game. You've purchased that game. If you have, then it's perfectly legal to do that, to create a backup file to share, download backup files of a game that you currently are in possession of. Otherwise, it, you're pretty much breaking copyright law. And because of that, sharing ROMs has always been kind of a legal gray area here in the United States. But we know that Nintendo, especially here on YouTube, does not like legal gray areas. They like to make sure they are in complete control of how everybody monetizes everything they do. So this next chunk of the story should not surprise you in the least. So two examples of a Nintendo lawyering up and flexing that lawyer muscle and all that money they have behind them. The first of which was a Game Boy Advanced emulator that was hosted over at GitHub. It was a JavaScript uh, emulator which allowed you to basically play those games that you may or may not legally be allowed to play uh, through that JavaScript emulator. But because they were hosting those ROMs in order for them to boot up in the JavaScript, um, basically Nintendo said that would be illegal. We want to shut you down and if you don't shut it down, we'll sue you. They decided to play along and they decided to go ahead and shut it down. It's a simple story there, not much to talk about there. The second story is a little more interesting because they are suing a small website developer for $100 million, give or take. 
uh, for hosting ROMs on two different websites. Now, these websites were, and they're both gone now, it was loveroms.com and loveretro.co. Now, these websites had been around for a while, and surely Nintendo knew about them. These were two of the most popular emulation websites on the internet. So, um, and there's plenty of other websites just like it. If you want to download Nintendo ROMs right now, it is super, super easy to do. But Nintendo decided to shut this one down because they were aware it was one of the most popular ones. They alleged in the lawsuit that they got about 17 million page views a month, which is very considerable. And then on top of that, they were monetizing it, making money from doing this. And in the lawsuit, Nintendo said, this isn't just a fan. This isn't just a small group of dedicated fans who love the games who are doing this. These are people who have marketed this. These are people who are making money from it. They have created a small business based of it. And we don't want them making money off of our intellectual property. And they actually sued them for $150,000 worth of damage per individual ROM they were hosting, which adds up to over a hundred million dollars worth of damages. Now, Nintendo will never see a dime of that money quite clearly. Um, they'll just shut down the websites and then end it all, and hopefully it'll, the case will get dismissed or thrown out of court. Hopefully it won't ruin these people's lives. But hey, Nintendo doesn't care either way if they ruin a life or not, as long as they get this shut down and people aren't making money off of their intellectual property. But again, that's something I'm curious as to what you think. Um, are these old games, Nintendo does monetize them from time to time. Do you feel like that's stealing from Nintendo or not? And, and since we do know there is a gray area with ROMs, I'm curious as to what you think about that as well. I will say, I own a lot of Nintendo games that I've either purchased throughout the years or still are in possession of. I don't mind emulating them. I don't know if you do. I certainly don't. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments section below. And while you're down there, don't forget to check out that link to this week's sponsor, which is the folks over at Glasses USA. Get yourself a pair of prescription sunglasses like these, a pair of beautiful glasses like I normally wear um, through that link, and you'll be supporting me at the same time. As always, guys, thanks for watching. I love you very much. I'll speak with you again soon. Now respect my authority! <laughs>